So you should see a pop up on your screen just letting you know that we are recording this session. So as always, I will send out a link to it after we are done. And thank you for joining us for our April webinar on humidification. As I mentioned last month, think of each of these webinars as building blocks. Today's session is another foundation block where we will discuss the nature of humidity and how it affects building occupants' health. Dan Hani is one of our senior sales engineers based out of our Phoenix office. Dan is also our resident educator and is excited to dive into the science behind humidification with you all today. If you have any questions, please put them in the chat and then we will review them at the end. So Dan, I will turn it over to you now. Kelly, thank you very much. And thank you all of you uh, for joining us today on the topic of humidification. We greatly appreciate your time and interest and we'll do everything we can to delve into the fundamentals of concepts that we use every day. Uh, and uh, the more we delve into them, we discover there are new aspects, new uh, uh, realizations on topics that uh, could perhaps enhance our own design capabilities and understanding of how HVAC systems work. So today's topic is uh, on uh, humidification. And uh, Kelly, if you can confirm, we've got the screen, the full screen mode opened up properly. Looks perfect. Everything ready to go. All right. Thank you so much. Uh, again, my name is Dan Hani, uh, Senior Sales Engineer for Veritex Solutions. I've introduced myself many times to a number of you already, so I won't labor on the point. But let me just say that I've been in the industry for 35 years, and Veritex brought me on board in 2016 to promote high efficiency system solution designs for heating and ventilating systems. Uh, and that has moved over into how do we design buildings uh, to be healthier, to reduce the risk of infectious spread or the spread of infections uh, since we've been challenged with the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, so <clears throat> first of all, just a quick introduction for those who may not have joined us in the past, who is Veritech? We are an HVAC system solution provider. We've been in the industry for over 40 years and have a presence throughout the Southwestern United States. And we provide heating and ventilating equipment and uh, are a resource for our design communities on how that equipment can be applied for healthcare, education, public works, government, any type of facility that might be part of the build environment, we can support those initiatives and efforts. We are also uh, uh, promoting and uh, moving forward in coming up with integrated system design concepts for uh, uh, the, the most high performance systems available in the market today. Uh, we could do variable refrigerant technologies, variable refrigerant technologies, packaged central plants. We have the means to control them. Uh, we're seeing growing momentum now for interest in ventilation systems, 100% outside air systems, as science is demonstrating the effectiveness of properly ventilated spaces will reduce the risk of, of the spreading of infectious disease. And we'll be uh, delving into those topics later in our seminar webinar series. So Veritech's mission is shaping the future uh, to promote uh, the advancement of heating and ventilating systems. We built the Veritech Technical Institute. Uh, our mission is to provide an educational platform for continued learning in the HVAC industry with a focus on high performance buildings and innovative technologies for a better built environment. So today's agenda, we're going to look at uh, uh, ASHRAE position document on infectious aerosols, just a quick review. And then we're going to delve into the nature of water. What are the states of water? What are the terms and definitions of what actually influences phase changes or states of water from ice water to vapor? We're gonna look at the physics of water vapor and I uh, take a moment to uh, look at what that might mean for my own home office and studio. Uh, and then we're gonna look at the risk of infection and how humidification can actually increase the risk of infection or decrease the risk of infection if spaces are designed to proper humidity levels. Then we're going to look at some just some quick building humidification solutions and at this time I'd like you to know that dry steam, the manufacturer of the uh, 
uh, uh, humidification products that we represent in cell uh, is here with us today. We have John Reese, our regional sales manager from Drysteen, who will be an excellent resource for the any questions that there might be regarding the application of a humidification generator solution for retrofit new construction. Uh, much of the material I've drawn is, uh, has to be really due to the resources I have available. Dry Steam has an excellent portfolio of resources that they can bring to the table to uh, help educate our design communities on good practice for laying out humidification systems. Of course, ASHRAE is the bedrock from which I build these presentations. They are the standard writers, they are the standard bearers and they are aggressive in promoting the advancement of heating and ventilating systems. And I also want to thank Dr. Clifford Ho of Sandia Labs for being a resource in helping me to better understand how pathogens travel within the build environment. So first of all, let's go back to the ASHRAE position document on infectious aerosols and get an update. First of all, I was at the uh, CDC uh, uh, site today seeing what the latest and greatest is with regard to what the Center for uh, Disease Control and Prevention is saying regarding SARS-CoV as an airborne uh, through uh, that's communicated via airborne transmission. Uh, it now has a statement that the principal mode by which people are infected with SARS-CoV-2, the virus that causes COVID-19 is through exposure to respiratory droplets carrying infectious virus. Now that's new. And uh, that sort of contradicts the statement with regard to the spread of infectious diseases as being one of the means. Um, so it's, uh, that's a little bit more aggressive statement. Uh, older statements can be found uh, from the CDC that say airborne transmission of SARS-CoV-2 can occur under special circumstances. COVID-19 can sometimes be spread by airborne transmission. COVID-19 spreads less commonly through contact with contaminated surfaces. Now that is new. Um, in fact, there was an article in the New York Times just last week on how there's less concern about fomitic transmission of SARS-CoV-2 as a means of transmission of the virus. So, uh, uh, so there's a little bit of conflict still within the CDC guidelines promoting full airborne uh, uh, aerosols as the means of uh, transmission versus can sometimes be spread by airborne transmission. I want you to know, however, ASHRAE has a little bit more of a, an aggressive stance on this. Uh, they just released as of April 5th, 2021, a newsletter that states updated air transmi airborne transmission guidance. And it states, airborne transmission of SARS-CoV-2 is significant and should be controlled. Now, that's a bold statement. It goes on to say, changes to building operations, including the operation of heating, ventilating, and air conditioning systems can reduce airborne exposures. And this statement, this more aggressive statement, replaces ASHRAE's April 2020 statement of last spring. So be aware of that. So let's review quickly some of the language that the ASHRAE position document on infectious aerosol states uh, that can be found on ASHRAE's Epidemic Task Force website. Uh, let's refer again to paragraph 3.3 in the document on temperature humidity. Uh, it states very clearly that the weight of evidence suggests that controlling RH reduces transmission of certain airborne infectious organisms including some strains of influenza. Uh, the Musabi et al. Uh, uh, report for ASHRAE in 2019 goes on to state, scientific literature generally reflects the most unfavorable survival conditions for microorganisms when the RH is between 40% and 60%. So uh, very aggressive uh, documentation and scientific research falls behind these design recommendations for uh, relative humidity. The position document also references a Taylor and Tazi 2018 report uh, in regard to dry environments. It states, infectious aerosols emitted from a primary host shrink rapidly to become droplet nuclei. 
and these dormant infectious pathogens remain suspended in the air and are capable of traveling great distances. The Kudo et al. 2019 study that the document also references states mechanisms through which ambient RH below 40% impairs mucous membrane barriers and other steps in immuno immune system protection. And we're gonna explore that in greater detail later on in this presentation. And then we have the Gaffa et al. 2009 statement saying many viruses and bacteria are anhydrous, that is to say they thrive in dry conditions, a concept I thought somewhat counterintuitive. Uh, anyway, viruses and bacteria are anhydrous resistant and actually have increased viability and in low RH conditions. The ASHRAE uh, position document uh, uh, also goes on uh, I'm sorry, the ASHRAE Epidemic Task Force website in their Building Readiness Guidelines has these uh, uh, statements uh, regarding for schools and universities. It states that the underlying effort of the design designers should be to increase outside air to the spaces, treat return air and or supply air to space via mechanical filtration and maintain indoor comfort as defined by the design temperature and relative humidity. Uh, under the general school terms and conditions or guidelines, it states that temperature and humidity in the winter should be set at 72 degrees dry bulb or thereabouts and at a humidity range of 40 to 50%. Uh, it also suggests that in summer classroom design guidelines that room set points be in the range of about 75 degrees Fahrenheit and 50 to 60% RH, so uh, high humidity levels. So, why are these authorities making these statements? What is actually occurring that uh, research is uncovering uh, as being uh, uh, why properly humidified spaces can reduce the risk of infection in the built environment? And before we understand that, we're gonna explore the nature of water. What is water and how does it behave? First of all, what is the definition of dry? The definition of dry is the absence of moisture. That's what it is. It's the absence of moisture. So what is water? What is moisture? It is a substance composed of chemical elements, hydrogen and oxygen, and it exists in either a gaseous, liquid, or solid state. And that's from the Encyclopedia Britannica. There are three states of water, as we all know. There's a liquid state, that uh, uh, water remains a fluid in between the temperatures of 32 to 212 degrees until it reaches boiling point when water is converted directly to vapor or boils. Uh, there's a gaseous state, water in the form of vapor, and there's a solid state, water in the form of, solid, of a solid or ice. <clears throat> so before we explore how these phase changes occur, Let's go back and review fundamental principles. Make sure we understand, we all have a common understanding of the terms so we can see what they mean with regard to physical states and processes. So first of all, we're gonna look at the definitions of energy, force, equilibrium, pressure, and then we're gonna explore what is vapor pressure, which is gonna be very important in this discussion. We're gonna look at what humidity ratio is or absolute humidity. We're gonna look at dew point. We're gonna look at relative humidity. So first of all, what is the definition of energy? Energy in physics, according to Encyclopedia Britannica states, is the capacity for doing work. We all learned that in high school physics classes uh, or in college physics. It is the capacity for doing work. And there are different forms of capacities for doing work. There is potential, kinetic, thermal, electrical, chemical, nuclear, and other forms. Today's discussion is going to involve thermal work or thermal energy. All forms of energy are associated from, uh, with motion. So energy is, and this is my way of terming it, hopefully it makes it a little clearer, Energy is the physical cause or force of motion and quantitative or qualitative effects. In other words, whatever creates change. So what is a force? 
In mechanics, any action that tends to maintain or alter the motion of a body or to distort it. That's Britannica again. So that's an important concept, force as being the action that tends to maintain or alter the motion of a body or to distort it. Then what is pressure? Pressure is a continuous physical force exerted on or against an object by something in contact with it. So pressure is the term we really want to make sure we have a common understanding and understand how moisture moves within an environment. Another term we need to understand is the term equilibrium. As again, referring back to high school physics and science classes, all physical states and or objects seek to be at rest. That is to say, a state of equilibrium. Thermal energy is the measured value at a, therm, uh, at a room thermostat. And anytime you look at a thermostat and you see a number, 78 degrees, 75 degrees, that number is saying, there is that much thermal energy in the room to arrive at that temperature reading. So it's a measure of the thermal energy or dry bulb temperature in a room. And heat energy always moves to cold. And so we'll always find energy moving either by conduction or convection from hot to cold, seeking equilibrium. And we're experiencing that every day. Well, what is pressure equilibrium? It is air or moisture at a high pressure state that tends to a lower pressure state. So wherever there's a differential in two states close to each other, high pressure will always move to low pressure to look for pressure equilibrium. So let's look at thermal energy again. Thermal energy or heat or dry bulb temperature is the heat added to a body or to a discrete volume of air that will disperse to create a state of equilibrium with adjacent areas. Moisture, and this is the important point, like thermal energy, will always move from wet conditions to drier conditions to achieve this state of equilibrium. So what force, again, remove, using basic terms, moves moisture from wet to dry. It is vapor pressure. The force that drives moisture from wet areas to drier areas. And this is important. In order for water vapor to exist, exist there must be heat energy in the air to sustain water in a vapor state. If you remove thermal energy from the air, water vapor will start to lose its ability to remain in a vapor state and will condense. So thermal energy is necessary for maintaining water or moisture in a vapor state. So what is vapor pressure? We looked at that just a moment ago. Vapor pressure is defined as the pressure of the vapor measured in inches of mercury resulting from evaporation of a liquid or solid, such as off-gassing of VOCs, above a sample of the liquid or solid. So if we look at this image here, it's basically the off-gassing of water from a fluid into this chamber, and the pressure that results from water changing from a fluid state to a vapor state is called vapor pressure. So the vapor pressure of a liquid, however, varies with its temperature. The wa warmer the water, the higher the vapor pressure, and the greater the tendency for water as a fluid to change its phase to water as a vapor. The change of water between any of its three states is a occurs when you add thermal energy and increasing vapor pressure increases the rate of vapor phase change. In other words, we have more water vapor produced from water fluid, the more energy that we enter into the system. So here's another term that we need to understand. Now that we understand that vapor pressure results in moisture moving from a fluid state to a vapor state, 
how do we measure how much water is in the air? Well, we use a term called absolute humidity, a measure of the actual amount of water vapor or moisture in the air, regardless of the temperature. So it is the physical mass of moisture in the air as a vapor. Pounds of water per pound of dry air is how we measure absolute humidity. So another way of explaining absolute humidity and understanding the concentration of water vapor in the air is to look at it as grains of moisture per pound of dry air. And there are 7,000 grains of moisture in one pound of water. So just, just be aware of that fact. So one grain of water weighs about 0.002 ounces. So if a room is designed at 75 degrees dry bulb, your thermal energy, and 40% relative humidity, then the specific humidity or the concentration or mass of water within the air as a vapor is 51.78 grains per pounds of dry air. That's your absolute moisture content. Also, the dew point is 49.08. Your specific humidity and dew point will not change if there's a change in temperature. It is a fixed value. That is how much moisture is in the air. So what is dew point? Dew point is the temperature air must be cooled to be saturated and water vapor condenses. So if you remove thermal energy from the air, then you reduce the excitation rate of water as a vapor. And as it reduces its uh, uh, movement rate, it tends to condensation and to return to a fluid state. So dew point can also be used as a measure of the actual moisture content in air. Dew point, like absolute humidity or specific humidity, is not dependent on temperature or the amount of thermal energy in the air. It is an absolute value of moisture concentration. Consequently, in ASHRAE standard 62.1 2019, which is the standard that writes the ventilation guidelines for buildings that uh, uh, a code authorities use and apply, has now uh, adopted dew point as its means for listing uh, humidity uh, requirements in the space to create a healthy environment. And this statement comes right out of the standard. It says humidity control requirements are now expressed as dew point and not as relative humidity. Well, <clears throat> I don't know about you, but I was always raised with relative humidity as a measure of the amount of moisture in the air. What is, how much relative humidity is there and why is ASHRAE moved away from using relative humidity as the matrix for more vape, water vapor concentration in the air. Uh, well, relative humidity is defined as the, uh, a measure of water in the air in respect to the amount of water air can hold, 100% RH, at a given temperature. Relative humidity is associated with temperature. So the warmer the air, the more thermal energy in the air, the more moisture or water vapor can be held in the air at a higher energy state. So <clears throat> if you look at the chart on the right, you can see that the actual dew point humidity ratio and water vapor at all three states remains the same, but the relative humidity changes because it is a percent of water in the air in relation to the amount of water the air can hold at that temperature. So that's relative humidity. And the reason why ASHRAE is moving away from it is because it varies with room set point temperature. Your dew point, humidity ratio, and vapor pressure will not change. So actual moisture content uh, uh, will actually be the same in all three states or three different temperature profiles. So how do you measure humidity? Well, I, I, I thought I was thinking of maybe not including this, but I, I, I think there'd be too many questions of why Dan didn't bring up the term wet bulb thermometer or wet bulb temperature. 
first of all, the old way of measuring how humid the air is outside or in a building was to use a wet bulb thermometer, which was a thermometer with a wetted wick or fabric wrapped around the base. And depending on how dry or moist the air is, that water in the wick will evaporate. And whenever you have a phase change of fluid to, uh, to vapor, in order to create that phase change, you need energy. So thermal energy is drawn from the environment to create the phase change, allowing for a wet bulb thermometer to read a different temperature than a dry thermometer that is measuring the actual thermal energy in the room. <clears throat> well, the differential between dry bulb and wet bulb temperature is the wet bulb depression. The greater the wet bulb depression, the higher the evaporation rate, the more humid the environment. And if you can define the value of wet bulb depression, whether it's 10 degrees, 15 degrees, or the differential between the dry bulb and wet bulb, you can calculate the dew point, you can calculate the absolute humidity, you can calculate the specific humidity, you can calculate the relative humidity just by knowing those two points. So it's a very important term to understand. And so I thought I'd bring it in here. And uh, it's very important for this reason, because providing I know any of these two design points on what is called a psychrometric chart that many of you use every day, we can define the other states of air as well, providing I know two of these points. So the psychrometric part uh, chart is really the fundamental or foundation of heating and ventilating systems and a, a wonderful tool and resource and understanding moisture content in relation to thermal energy. So what is the nature of water? The physics of water vapor, how does it move? Well, if you don't mind, I'm gonna use my own office as an example. Uh, my office, my study is at elevation of 1100 feet here in Scottsdale. And I have a personal interest in photography. I do photography and I do all my own processing, printing, uh, I use archival grade papers and I've got a collection, a library of ar ar archival grade photographic prints that need to be maintained at a room set point of 75 degrees, 40% RH, roughly. Uh, I, my, my means of doing that are somewhat crude, but uh, it does seem to be effective. So at 75 degrees, 40% RH, which is right in line with ASHRAE standard 55, room set point conditions for a healthy environment, we actually have a dew point setting of 49.8 degrees. We have a humidity ratio or absolute humidity of 53.91 grains per pound of dry air. And we have a vapor pressure, that all important term of 0.35 because it's vapor pressure that drives moisture. So <clears throat> I had some fun this winter. I, I keep a, I have a room temperature sensor and a relative humidity sensor in my office. And uh, I looked at the outside conditions uh, during a winter rainstorm. I think we had one in January. And it was reading outside at 45 degrees at 92% RH and it was raining. Well, the outdoor uh, uh, dew point was equal to 42.83. The outside humidity ratio was 42.44 grains of moisture per pound of dry air, and the vapor pressure was 0.27. So my studio at 75 degrees, 40% RH, at a dew point of 49 degrees, a humidity ratio of 53.91 and a vapor pressure of 0.35, my modest little off was, was trying to humidify the outdoors because of the vapor pressure differential. Moisture in my room was trying to move outdoors to humidify a rainy day. And that's an interesting concept that you have to understand. And it's gonna be very important understanding uh, how we deal with humidity in a building. So uh, why, why is my office trying to heat the outdoors? Remember, due to vapor pressure, the vapor pressure differential wet moves to dry, water moves to dry, and that is just the way it is. 
So obviously, when we design heating and ventilating systems in Arizona, we're concerned about the outdoor condition. Uh, in monsoon, we have a lot of moisture that comes up from the equator. And uh, uh, we need to be aware of, and when we do our HVAC designs, uh, a general design condition is 98 degrees Fahrenheit dry bulb. I'm a little more aggressive and use a relative humidity during monsoon of 40.59%. I think that works out to about 78 degrees wet bulb. So <clears throat> if we look at that, the dew point uh, uh, of the air at that condition is 70 degrees. That's when we have moisture uh, forming on cold surfaces, such as a glass of iced tea or a cold glass of soda. Uh, the humidity ratio is 115.42 grains per pound, and the vapor pressure is 0.74. So it is double the vapor pressure and moisture content of Dan's office. Consequently, on a monsoon day at these design conditions, we'll find moisture from the outdoors trying to flood into my office to humidify it, which as far as my prints are concerned, that's a good thing. However, did you know, and this is a little bit surprising, that what we refer to as our Phoenix summer dry months are dry conditions, that a design temperature of 115 degrees ambient, a relative humidity of 15%, which is common in June and July or lower, the dew point outdoors is 55.9 degrees. The humidity ratio is 69.55 grains per pound and the vapor pressure is 0.45. So in our dry conditions, I don't have a humidity challenge in maintaining my room at 75 degrees at 40% RH because the vapor pressure is 0.10 greater than the actual vapor pressure in my studio. So uh, this is a concept that you need to be aware of that our dry time of the year is not June and July when it's 115 degrees. Our dry time is when we're in our winter months. And that's what we need to be really concerned about. So congratulations. You've just graduated from Psychrometrics 101 that is the foundation of all heating and ventilating systems. And if there's a couple of points I want to make sure you understand is the definition of dryness is the absence of moisture. And remember, wet drives to dry. Moisture moves to drier environments because of pressure or the force of vapor pressure. So what is the risk of infection? <clears throat> By making sure that we address humidity in a building. Well, first of all, what about cold and flu season? It occurs during late autumn, winter, and early spring. This is the driest time of the year. And it begs the question, is it accidental that we have cold and flu season during the driest time of the year? So as we begin to explore this, let's review the, uh, uh, some of the terms and topics that we covered in our pathogen migration webinar. First of all, if somebody is sick in a building and they're talking or they are breathing or they are coughing or sneezing and they're ejecting pathogen into the space, what does that mean with regard to the virus laden droplets they project under those various activities? We discovered <clears throat> relying on Dr. Ho's paper and CFD modeling from Sandia Labs and the AHRI droplet design guideline and buoyancy and flotation factors that through these expiratory events, droplets can be released of less than one micron up to 100 microns or more. Pathogen counts differ from tens to 40,000 droplets. Discharge velocities, depending on the expiratory event, vary from 2.2 to 44 miles per hour. And there isn't a uniform laminar plume ejected from the infected person. It could vary, especially in more violent activities, such as coughing or sneezing, where bifurcated plumes can occur. And high momentum, large particles are discharged 23 to, 60, 23 to 26 feet into the environment 
where hopefully if they maintain their mass and their density or their size, they'll precipitate quickly out of the air. So <clears throat> let's quickly review as well that when somebody is breathing in a more subdued activity, that the droplet sizes fall in the domain of small droplets or aerosols or particles that are 10 microns or less. If you are talking and being more specific in how you express yourself and consequently any associated droplet into the space, those droplets are larger. And of course, the larger that they are, the more potential there is for being laced with infectious pathogen in that larger droplet. So consequently, it can impact anybody who was in the local environment of that person. Coughing or sneezing, the droplets increase. The trajectory can also increase. And what happens to that droplet after it's expressed from an occupant uh, is really dependent upon temperature and humidity in those environments. Well, why is that? Well, if you look at what is the cause of the persistence of small aerosolized particles? The state of pathogens and particles that the CDC and now ASHRAE more aggressively is saying, we need to be concerned about aerosolized pathogen as being a means of transmission, not only of SARS-CoV-2 or COVID-19, but also influenza, MERS, and any other infection that is out there. First of all, droplets that are expressed by an infected person are comprised predominantly of water. Saliva droplets, 98 to 99.5% water. Mucus droplets, 95% water. So they're mostly water. So the goal, <clears throat> what we want to do if somebody is sick and in the environment and they have an expiratory event, whether it's breathing, coughing, or sneezing, we want to reduce the rate at which that droplet is aerosolized. Uh, and we can uh, that will otherwise be rather, uh, uh, that will occur more quickly uh, if we have a dry condition and we have a uh, high evaporation rate. So by cr creating an environment with the proper humidity, we actually uh, uh, reduce the vapor pressure of the room condition versus the droplets, the wet droplets emitted, and you can reduce the evaporation thereby maintaining the size of the droplets longer, giving them less float time in the air and the reduced rate of aerosolization. So the higher the room RH, the higher the vapor pressure, the higher the room vapor pressure, the longer the evaporation rate and the uh, precipitation rate of larger particles will begin to dominate. So let's explore why this occurs. Uh, well, if, if, if you ever really want to examine the states of air on your iPhone or whatever, I invite you to download for free Munter's Psychrometric app. I use this every day. <laughs> it is brilliant. It is a lot easier than using a psychrometric chart, let me tell you. Uh, but anyway, so why, what is the rate of desiccation of droplets expressed by an infected person into a room? Well, let's look at the vapor pressure differential. Um, let's look at a room environment that has a condition design set point of 75 degrees at 40% RH. That has a vapor pressure of 0.35 inches of mercury. Let's look at a discharge plume of an infected person. Minimum, it's going to be 98 degrees. It could be 101 or 102, but it's going to be ejected at 100% RH. The vapor pressure of that plume ejected from a person is 1.821. That's an extreme differential. So consequently, discharged droplets evaporate in fractions of a second to several seconds, depending on the size of the droplets expressed. So as we showed in the presentation on pathogen migration, anybody who's sick, who's just breathing normally without talking, coughing, or sneezing, has a tidal breathing volume of about half a liter per each breath at about 16 breaths per minute. That's eight liters per minute per person. And in an drier environment, uh, it, those droplets that are expressed, those smaller droplets will be uh, aerosolized very quickly. An aerosolized droplet nuclei or viral nuclei will 
uh, uh, occur within the space and you'll increase your concentration of uh, aerosolized virus in the space. Again, let's lean on Dr. Clifford Ho to make this observation I shared with you on my last presentation with you. Dr. Ho states that because the size of droplets that are emitted during tidal breathing are small, the exhaled aerosol plume can remain suspended for long uh, periods. Thus, despite the lower viral load per exhalation event relatives to coughs or sneezes, that is to say the smaller the droplets, the less viral load the droplet, the persistence of a small aerosolized droplet and continuous nature of breathing and or talking can increase the potential for transmission, especially in enclosed environments or spaces with low fresh air exchange. So um, what does this mean with regard to aerosolized droplets in the human immune system? Well, aerosolized pathogens more readily bypass the body's natural defense systems and consequently they'll move deeper into the lungs. The Kudo 35 et al. study in 2019 made the statement that immunobiologists, immunobiologists have now clarified the mechanisms through which ambient RH below 40% impairs mucous membrane barriers and other steps in immune system protection. Well, why is that? Ingested wet droplets are more likely to be captured by nasal membranes and wet walls of mouth and the wet walls of the esophagus. The virus expelled uh, consequently can be expelled from the body more readily through coughing or sneezing. Pathogens shed from saliva mucus droplets become aerosolized. Um, and then the viral nuclei are smaller. So viral nuclei that are smaller and do not have the water component of the droplet associated with them can travel deep into the lungs, avoiding the wet, moist lining of the esophagus of the mouth. And when that virus is drawn into the lungs, that is where it causes the biggest health hazard. A wet and a moist environment or an environment maintained within 40 to 60% is conducive for optimizing our immune system. Uh, why is that? As I expressed, inhaled particles collide with the airway walls where they get stuck on slimy surfaces. And <clears throat> when they do so, nature developed a power mechanism to self-clean the airways using cilia that operate as conveyor belts to always move, move mucus and consequently contaminant and pathogen up out of the lungs and out of the body. Uh, so the more moist the environment is, the more efficient the system is because the mucus that is housing those ingested contaminants maintains a viscosity that allows it to be more fluid, allowing for more effective discharge. So uh, some of the statements with regard to human, um, human immune system uh, can be shown that uh, COVID-19 behaves similarly to SARS-CoV-1 and MERS and H1N1. Uh, the length of time virus is airborne and distance traveled affects the spread and severity of infection. Respiratory viruses are most harmful when inhaled deep into the lungs. And low ambient humidity causes aerosols to desiccate into virus nuclei that can travel long distances far beyond the six foot social distancing guidelines advocated by the World Health Organization and the CDC. Uh, excuse me. So what are studies to support this? They're, the research goes back 35 years. It's, it's, it's definitive. Uh, the Sterling study in 1986 done for ASHRAE came out clearly and advocated uh, a, a humidity range of between 40 to 60%. The Stephen Welty paper written in 2013 with regard to the, uh, 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 the HPA, uh, I'm sorry, the H1N1 flu pandemic that occurred came out and stayed categorically that 50% RH indoor humidity is uh, really the best cure to reduce the effects of flu season and keeping people healthier. So 50% is what Stephen Welty arrived at in 2013. 
The Stephen Walty paper also went on to express other solutions as well, such as increasing air change rates. Uh, we'll explore air change rates when we do the ventilation section of this webinar series. Use induct UV lighting or upper room UV lighting. Lower toilet seats, a good practice. And upgrade your filtration and look for a modal approach by layering different types of pathogen mitigation strategies to reduce the risk of flu. And I'm sure many of you have heard this year, what happened to the flu season? Well, because such, there was such a wide sector of our population using good practices for reducing the risk of infection, we didn't see the flu season this year. And uh, uh, consequently, we know that these are effective practices in reducing the spread of contagion in an environment. Yale, AHRI, and Mayo Clinic have all done studies that demonstrate that increasing humidity levels from 40 to 60% is a good practice for reducing the risk of infection spread um, in a building. So uh, um, again, a lot, of, a lot of studies, a lot of research that over and over and over again demonstrate that proper humidity control in the building is an excellent, if not perhaps one of the best solutions for reducing the risk of infection. Uh, so building humidification solutions, what are there? And I'd like to let you know, again, I'd like to say we have John Reese here with Dry Steam, our regional sales manager who can really be a resource if there's any immediate question on how we might apply specific discrete humidification solutions to different types of environments. Uh, please be aware that we can apply moisture control strategies for new buildings, for retrofit. They can be uh, applied to office buildings, uh, 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 university educational facilities. They could be provided for uh, uh, hospitals as well, healthcare facilities. And there are many different types of solutions from steam generation, to uh, 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 electro uh, uh, generation should, uh, 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 we, we could actually use electric heat to generate steam or we can use gas fired heat. We can use evaporative cooling strategies. Uh, please be aware that you'd also wanna be aware with many of these solutions of maintaining the proper water quality uh, to prevent scaling on your solution. And again, it depends on the type of unit that you're gonna be applying. Um, so just quickly, one thing to be aware of if you're even considering using humidification products to maintain proper building set points, uh, then a national average is you would design a system to use approximately three pounds of water per 100 CFM of outside air that would be applicable, especially during our uh, drier winter months, uh, late fall, early spring months as well. And uh, that would help us get an understanding of the actual load of water that would need to be introduced to the space. And uh, uh, John, if you have any other points and if you're available, we would welcome your input at this time to uh, let us know what might be some quick guidelines for uh, selecting humidification products to properly humidify spaces. Yeah, thanks, Dan. Uh, yeah, ju just generally as um, st stated there, you can hear me, right, Dan? Yes. Okay. Uh, yeah, we have a just a, a very uh, uh, we do have a load calculator on our website. You can easily plug it in. It's called Load Calc. If you go to our drysteam.com website, but um, the uh, there's a, just a rule of thumb that we typically use, and it's it's all, it's based on outside air and how much we're bringing into the building at a you know a design condition. And uh, that, as stated on the slide, it's three pounds per hour per 100 CFM. So that would be your, your generation capacity or the amount of moisture that we need to add to, to that airstream per hour for every 100 CFM of outside air. So that's, that's just a useful rule of thumb um, because we know, typically we know how much outside air is being brought in. A lot of times it's guesswork, you know, if you're looking at infiltration and how many air changes, you know, per hour or per day um, that you're looking at, but it's a, it's a similar concept. And uh, we just look back over a psychometric chart to determine what the grains of moisture are that we're trying to add over 
you know, given a period of time, and that helps us to uh, calculate the generator size. So, uh, uh, John, yeah, John have I have a question for retrofit applications. Uh, there are a lot of old buildings out there that are not very tight. Uh, that's going to have to be a concern, isn't it, in uh, designing uh, how to size your humidification uh, products? Uh, yes, ab absolutely. As, as you pointed out, the vapor pressure is going to drive that. And so, um, you know, it, it's a, if it's a dry uh, uh, wintertime condition, we are going to get infiltration into the zone. So typically, you know, we'll, we'll see at least a one to two air changes um, per hour is, is a, is a uh, rough um, uh, for, for, for a leaky building, you know, a, marginal building so that's uh, that's probably a good estimate but there are more um, more uh, specific design guidelines to uh, to to be able to determine that but um, once we know that the 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 load then we can you know if we depending on the energy source we can uh, look at what we can apply gas electricity propane or or steam systems um, many times electric is the easiest way to go on specific uh, retrofit applications, but uh, gas is typically one third to one quarter the cost of operation. Then we'll look at our water supply, you know, it, and if we need water treatment, that is definitely uh, a consideration, especially in the, in the southwest uh, regions where we have fairly hard water um, that is going to cause scaling. Um, on our heat exchangers and heaters and in our tanks over time. So uh, that, that's, that's a uh, annual uh, maintenance concern. Um, but then uh, an, another very good technology to consider, especially on larger volume applications is, is adiabatic uh, high pressure atomization, which we're seeing a lot more now, even in healthcare, um, where we, we can actually provide humidification and uh, take advantage of the cooling effect of, of uh, the adiabatic process. So um, those are some, some good technologies to look at. And, yeah, an ASHRAE standard 170 2017 now does have guidelines for uh, adiabatic uh, humidification, doesn't it, John? Yes, it does. It's, uh, it's, it's now allowable, and we are actually looking at some healthcare applications in, in Arizona currently and um, we we should be um, uh, providing that uh, this year on a, on a very large medical project. Excellent. John, thank you so much. Uh, appreciate your input and guidance uh, today. So uh, that concludes the presentation. Are there any questions? There are no questions in the chat at the moment. So if anybody does have a question, go ahead and pop it in the chat or you can come off mute and ask as well. Yes, Tim, I will be sending out a copy of the presentation within the next week along with PDH certificates for anybody who requested them. All right. Well, thank you very much for joining us today. Uh, I hope you found today's uh, session informative and we look forward to seeing you uh, next month when uh, we'll be approaching the technology of UVC lighting as a solution for creating healthier environments. Kelly, thank you so much. And thank you all of you. Thank all of you for joining us today. Thank you, Dan. Thank you, everyone. We'll see you next month.